It's my pleasure to introduce myself. My name is Dr. Nizami. I've been uh, a practicing physician for the last 23, 24 years. Uh, very involved with research and uh, drug development in the field of cancer. I uh, have been practicing in Newport Beach, California for the uh, last 15 years and very excited to bring some new information for patients as well as, well as providers. My background uh, has been extensively involved with uh, training other physicians and other oncologists and I've been honored to be involved with uh, major academic institutions that have been involved in research in cancer and uh, I think uh, I've been very blessed also to have the ability to uh, connect the dots between the research and clinic and be able to transform the clinical practice into um, a cutting edge uh, treatment that can provide new hope for the patients. I mean, in your experience in the clinic, um, did you stumble upon, on accident, your treatment, or was it intentional? Over the years, I've been very successful treating patients with cancer um, to the point that many believe that my treatments are uh, providing beyond hope that is experienced outside. Um, and as such, I get a lot of questions. Um, specifically, I get a question if uh, my success and discoveries and abilities to treat these patients were a product of accidents or this was a discovery uh, by intention. And I can tell you personally, I do not believe in any accidents. But that said, I believe that there was a divine intervention for me to be able to accomplish what I did. And that part I cannot rule out. Uh, on my uh, personal part, uh, I'm a very good observer. So I have learned from the patients over the years to be able to practice and be able to educate myself on the next and next and next patients. What I think is missed in the conventional world is that most of the oncologists, when they treat a patient and there is no uh, meaningful results for a specific treatment, they continue to do the same treatments. And what I have resisted was uh, I did not want to continue a treatment when there was no efficacy and the patient was not responding. So I had the autonomy when I started my practice by choice to be able to choose what treatments I think would best benefit the patient and not just follow the order. Uh, so in that sense, I think I had the special personality looking outside the box to be able to provide meaningful solutions each time, learning from one patient and applying to the next. Dr. Zambi, when you say um, least toxic, most um, effective treatment available, what does that mean? Uh, the treatments that we have been working on in the last 20 years uh, are based on a philosophy of least toxic and most effective uh, interventions. What I mean by that is when a patient is diagnosed with cancer, the general uh, concept is that that person has to pay a big price losing his or her quality of life significant toxicity from conventional treatments, yet not knowing if the treatment is going to work or not. But for sure the toxicity is there and that's not a question. Uh, many patients in the big surveys that they have been published, they just refuse to do conventional treatments because of the hurdle of the toxicity. And they uh, care about the quality of life more than the quantity. So when I started my practice, my goal was to bring both best quality and quantity of life to the patients. As such, the style of my practice has been designed over the years to promote therapies that meet both goals, least toxic and most effective treatments. If a treatment is toxic and uh, yet the efficacy is questionable, I do not recommend that. I recommend treatments that we have uh, information that justifies that the treatment is going to be effective and the toxicity is reasonable or none. As such, we have developed the treatments called MTET or multi-targeted epigenetic therapies that accomplish both. So, Dr. Nizami, what does a hereditary cancer mean? Uh, so, uh, the longest uh, 
For the longest time, we believed that cancer is a genetic disease. Um, now we know that cancer not only is a genetic disease, but it's actually an epigenetic disease. What that means is that uh, what we are, as a generation, exposed to that can cause cancer may, in fact, impact our next generation, our kids and grandkids. The whole science of epigenetics is exactly that. It talks about what is beyond the gene. Epi means beyond, epigene. What's beyond the gene is actually the transcription of the gene, the chemical reactions that happens in the DNA that causes the DNA to translate differently, transcribe differently. And as a matter of fact, uh, many scientists have worked on this field, including epigenetic dream, dream team that I had conversations with them about uh, our specific treatment as epigenetic therapies. So bottom line is that when somebody is exposed to a carcinogen, he or she may be affected by cancer. And if not, the next generation can be affected by cancer where the genetic insult now is called an epigenetic insult. The therapy is dedicated to reverse this damage of called epigenetic therapies. Dr. Nizami, with your knowledge and um, all your experience, if, if you were diagnosed with cancer today, what would you do? Uh, that's a very good question, and I always put myself in the shoes of a patient. I have lost family members, close family members with cancer, so I know how it feels for both patient and family members. Uh, diagnosis of cancer is a very shocking diagnosis, and most of the patients, unfortunately, uh, will deal uh, with the diagnosis with fear. So my first recommendation to the patient is to take, try to, at least, take that fear out uh, from their decision making because uh, one of the most important elements of making an informed decision is to be informed and in order for you to be informed about your choices when it comes to care you have to be able to calm down relax and, and be able to make a decision uh, in an environment that you don't react uh, one of the ideas that I've had for the longest time was to uh, put together a plan for the patients that they can understand their choices and make that available uh, for public so they know that when they see the doctor they can be informed and also they can be their own advocate because being uh, your own advocate when you see the doctor knowing about your choices brings up much more uh, possibilities for you to make the right decision. Dr. Nizami, can you talk about your experience in the clinic as it relates to trans translational research in medicine? Um, one of the most important um, uh, experiences that I've had over the last decade was working with a lot of PhDs in the field of cancer. And the experience that I had with these folks were that they are looking at the biology of cancer completely different than MDs do. Uh, in fact, back in 2011 and 12, where for the first time the word epigenetics came out, I was one of the first MDs that participated in any conference in the world that they were talking about epigenetics. I would go to this conference and I'd find myself among my hundreds of PhDs sitting there, and honestly, I couldn't understand the word they were talking about. Um, but that's because we're not trained in, uh, in the work of the research in the biology field. Most of us are just uh, practicing medicine based on what's approved by the FDA and the pharmaceutical reps basically promote it. So the arm of the marketing of pharmaceutical companies has unfortunately covered uh, most of the translational science so it's unseen. Uh, when the cloud uh, moves then you see the sun and the cloud is the marketing that is pushed by pharmaceutical companies so the sun which is the real translational science, the science that the PhDs have been working on epigenetic science, one of them, uh, is covered when, under the, uh, uh, the clouds. So uh, translational science basically implies the science that goes in the field of biology of cancer cell and how we can translate that into the clinic. We call it translational science. But is it possible to translate that to the clinic without having the clouds removed? that's the most difficult part because there are so many treatments that as a patient no one has heard about but these treatments are very effective for treatment of cancer because the standard of care is dictated by the people who make 
the, the approvals at the FDA and by pharmaceutical companies that push for the marketing. So in the book, I emphasize a lot about what are there that most of the patients can access independently. I encourage the patients to be their own advocate and research on their own so that they can access to this useful information when it comes to their treatment. Dr. Nzami, you recently wrote a book, Transition from Crime to Care and Oncology. Why did you write this book and who did you write it for? Recently, I have uh, authored a new book in oncology called Transition from Crime to Care. Uh, this book is a critical review of the literature that has been published in the last two to three years in oncology. Uh, the aim of the book is to provide awareness both to providers and public about the bias involved with research involved with cancer. Unfortunately, most of the research that has been conducted in the field of oncology has been sponsored by pharmaceutical companies. And these companies, by definition, try to prove the concept of their treatment. And as such, the results of these research mainly have been biased and the book intends to bring awareness about these biases and try to um, provide meaningful uh, solutions to the patients. Dr. Zami, who should buy this book, Transition from Crime to Care and Oncology, and why? I think anybody who has cancer uh, or their relatives and family or friends are um, affected by the cancer should buy the book and read that. Also, the book has a very important section called Preventive Oncology. Uh, that section is dedicated to bring awareness about the ways that you can prevent cancer, specifically uh, addressing the need about genetic testing and providing meaningful treatments for patients, actually normal individuals who are at risk for getting cancer. And um, that can bring a lot of information also to the providers to counsel the patients and individuals if they're at risk for cancer. Also, the book is an uh, asset, I believe, as far as data that can be used for further research and generating more hypotheses when it comes to further research in oncology. Dr. Zami, in your book, Transition from Crime to Care in Oncology, you have a chap chapter on cancer prevention. Where do you see the state of cancer prevention in the general community? Um, in my book, I have a chapter that is dedicated exactly for uh, preventive oncology. Uh, the reason that this subject is so important is because the incidence of cancer, unfortunately, is rising, especially in the younger individuals. Uh, just in the last two years, we've had significant increases in um, patients aged less than 50 years and uh, in some areas of the world less than 40 years. Uh, with different types of cancer, including colorectal cancer and other types of cancer. And despite all the efforts that have been done in the research as well as trying to screen these patients, all the screenings usually start at the later ages. So these uh, individuals are left without a screening and uh, all of a sudden they get a diagnosis of cancer. As I explained before, unfortunately, cancer affects otherwise normal and healthy individuals. So it's not like chronic conditions like heart disease and other conditions that that affects older individuals who have been struggling with chronic diseases. So you can imagine how this can impact the uh, public um, productivity when you have a big segment, especially the younger individuals, uh, dealing with a very difficult uh, disease. In the book, I express um, a fundamental way of looking at the screening by looking at the genetics of a person since that person is born and you can actually do, uh, do the testings and prevent that disease from happening. But unfortunately, these testings and treatments are not available currently in the clinics, so it's so important to change the status quo. Dr. Nzami, in your new book, Transition from Crime to Care and Oncology, it's stated to be a critical review of current cancer research and its applications. What does that mean? Uh, the subtitle of the book, uh, which is Critical Review of current cancer research and its applications in clinic. It basically opens the eyes of the providers or clinicians to the other side of the uh, oncology field, which is research, because the problem with uh, clinicians as MDs is that they are unaware of the research that mostly is going on uh, on experimental therapeutics, and they're only prescribing what has been approved by the FDA. 
Unfortunately, there is a big gap between the PhDs that are working in the research field in oncology and the MDs that are practicing that. And this book tries to close the gap, bringing the research into the clinic, as well as creating an environment of dialogue, a legitimate uh, conversation about the research and what unfortunate biases are there in clinical research. Dr. Mazami, what other books are you planning to write in the future? My first book that I co-authored was textbook in integrative oncology that was published with collaboration with Andrew Wells and other authors. The second book is Transition from Crime to Care in Oncology. That's the book that I have authored and you can actually buy it from uh, Amazon and other booksellers. Uh, I'm planning to write several other books in the coming months and years. The third book would be published uh, probably by the end of this year, meaning December 2022, and it should uh, include the summary of the cases that I have treated over the last 10 years. The book is going to be an extensive um, eye-opener and breakthrough as far as information that comes to the hands of the providers. Uh, the third book is called MTET, um, Bringing the Miracles uh, as a Standard in Clinic. So I hope that uh, providers will have access to all three books. Dr. Mazzoni, what are your primary passions in life? My personal passion since I was in medical school was to help people who have no other hope. Uh, many uh, students, they go to medicine for a variety of reasons. For me, it was all about trying to help others. So when I started my practice, uh, my main focus was trying to develop new treatments that uh, are providing uh, meaningful survival advantage to patients who have no other hope in the field of cancer. So my passion is to bring awareness and education to people, uh, public education as well as providers, and I hope that one day we would have uh, no word as cancer as experienced these days by providers as a terrifying word for the patients. So we have hope for everybody.